Life and Doctrine of St. Catherine of Genoa. Introduction. The publication of the life of St. Catherine of Genoa at this moment is, for several reasons, opportune. The reading of it will correct the misconceptions of many who honestly fancy that the Catholic Church encourages a mechanical piety, fixes the attention of the soul almost, if not altogether, on outward observances, and inculcates nothing beyond a complete submission to her authority and discipline. The life of our saint is an example of the reverse of that picture. It makes clear the truth that the immediate guide of the Christian soul is the Holy Spirit, and that her uncommon fidelity to the inspirations of the Holy Spirit made this holy woman worthy of being numbered by the church among that class of her most cherished children, who have attained the highest degree of divine love which it is possible for human beings to reach upon the earth. The mistake of the persons above spoken of arises from their failing to see that the indwelling Holy Spirit is the divine life of the church, and that her sacraments have for their end to convey the Holy Spirit to the soul. It arises also from their not sufficiently appreciating the necessity of the authority and discipline of the church as safeguards to the soul from being led astray from the paths of the Holy Spirit. Without doubt God could have, if he had so pleased, saved and sanctified the souls of men in spite of their ignorance, perversity, and weakness, by the immediate communication and action of the Holy Spirit in their souls, independently of an external organization like the church. But such was not his pleasure or his plan. For his own wise reasons, he chose to establish a church which he authorized to teach the world whatsoever he had commanded, which he promised to be with unto the end of all time, whose ministry, sacraments, and government should serve him, as his body had, to continue and complete, by a visible means, the work of man's redemption. Hence it is an entirely false view of the nature and design of the church, to suppose that it was intended to be, or is in its action, or ever was, or ever can be, a substitute for the authority of Christ, or the immediate guidance of the Holy Spirit in the Christian soul. The authority of the church is no other than the authority of Christ, as he himself has declared. He that heareth you, heareth me. The sacraments are nothing else than the channels, or visible means, of communicating the Holy Spirit to the soul. It is the divine action in the church, which gives to its external organization the principal reason for its existence. And it is equally false, and at the same time absurd, to suppose for a moment that the Holy Spirit indwelling in the church, and embodied in her visible authority, and the same Holy Spirit dwelling in and inspiring the Christian souls, should ever contradict each other, or come into collision. Whenever, by supposition, this takes place, be assured it is not the work of the Holy Spirit, but the consequence of ignorance, error, or perversity on the part of the individual. For it must not be forgotten, or ever be lost sight of, that it pleased Christ our Lord to promise to his church that the gates of hell shall not prevail against her, and not to teach individual Christians. The test, therefore, of the sincerity of the Christian soul in following the inspirations of the Holy Spirit will be shown, in case of uncertainty, by its prompt obedience to the voice of the Holy Church. It is only when the soul goes astray from the paths of the Holy Spirit, it finds trammels to its feet. Otherwise, it is conscious of perfect liberty in the Church of God. From the foregoing truths, the following practical rule of safe conduct can be drawn. The immediate guide of the soul to salvation and sanctification is the Holy Spirit, and the criterion or test that the soul is guided by the Holy Spirit is its ready obedience to the authority of the Church. With this rule there can be no danger of going astray, and the soul can walk in absolute security, in the ways of sanctity. This is the way in which all the saints have trod to arrive at Christian perfection, but no life illustrates this truth more plainly, so far as we are aware, than the life of our saint. There are others who think that the church fosters a sanctity which is not concerned with this present life, rendering one useless to society, and indifferent to the great needs of humanity. The love of God and the love of one's neighbor, as taught by Christ and his apostles, are essentially one. 
if the saints of the church were distinguished for their great love for god they ought therefore to be equally distinguished for their great love for mankind the one is the test of the other if any man say i love god and hateth his neighbor he is a liar such is the emphatic language of st john let us apply this test with the history of the church and the biographies of her saints in our hands take for example the religious orders and it is a fair one for nearly all of them were founded by saints whose special aim it was to teach and practice christian perfection as understood by the catholic church what do these pages of history and biography teach us all that we possess of the classics and of literature in every department pagan as well as christian prior to the invention of the art of painting we owe exclusively to the industry and labor of the early monks not a slight service these men were for the most part the founders and professors of the great universities and colleges in england italy spain france germany and ireland the last were not the least for the monks of ireland were famous as founders of colleges and seats of learning in their own as well as in foreign countries monks were the pioneers in agriculture and in many industrial and mechanical arts while their monasteries became the centers of great cities many of which still retain their names they were the sowers of those seeds which being developed by time men of our day claim all the honor of their results but modestly under the title of modern civilization idle monks and nuns were they they were as a class men and women who ate less worked harder and did more for intellectual progress civilization and social well-being than any other body of men and women whose record can be found on the pages of history or who can be pointed out in this nineteenth century as for works of mercy such is the superabundance of material that it is difficult to know where to begin and how to leave off the brotherhoods and sisterhoods in the church devoted to the care and relief of the sick the orphan the aged the poor the captive the prisoner the insane and to the thousand and one ills that human nature is heir to as well as those which are self-inflicted who can count them true there were some religious orders which were given almost exclusively to contemplation but these were exceptional vocations and were so considered by the church these had also a most important social bearing and practical value which however this is not the place to demonstrate but the great majority of her saints were men and women whose hearts were overflowing with warm and active sympathy for their race consecrating their energies to its improvement spiritually intellectually morally and bodily and not seldom laying down their lives for its sake that the church did not compel all her children seeking christian perfection into one uniform type is true governed by that divine wisdom which made man differ from man in his talents and aptitudes she did not attempt to mar and wrong their nature but sought to elevate and sanctify each in his own peculiar individuality read the life of st catherine and in imagination fancy her in the city hospital of genoa charged not only with the supervision and responsibility of its finances but also overseeing the care of its sick inmates taking an active personal part in its duties as one of its nurses and the whole establishment conducted with strict economy perfect order and the tenderest care and love fancy this for a moment in the city hospital of genoa in the sixteenth century and seek for her compeer in the city of new york or any other city in the world in our day and if you find one and outside of the catholic church then but not till then you may repeat to your heart's content that she fosters a sanctity which turns one's attention altogether away from this world and makes one indifferent to the wants of humanity st catherine's life teaches another lesson to those whose mental eyes are not closed to facts as plain as the sun when shining at noonday we hear much said and not a little is written in the united states and in england about the exclusion of women from spheres of action for which her natural aptitudes fit her equally and in many cases render her superior to men of her partial education and in many cases the inferior position which she is forced to accept in society strange that we hear no such complaints in catholic society or from catholic women 
Is it because they have been taught to hug the chains which make them slaves? Or that they are denied the liberty of speech? Or that their lips are closed by arbitrary authority? Not at all. The reason is plain. Women, no less than men, are free to occupy any position whose duties and functions they have the intelligence or aptitude to fulfill. They have the opportunities and are free to obtain the highest education their capacities are capable of. This, every Catholic woman knows and feels, and hence the absence of all consciousness, in the Church, of being deprived of her rights, of oppression and injustice. One has but to open his eyes and read the pages of ecclesiastical history to be convinced that in the Catholic Church there has been no lack of freedom of action for women. Look for a moment at the countless number of sisterhoods in the church, some counting their members by thousands, all under the government of one head, a woman, and elected by themselves for life. Others again, each house forming a separate organization, with a superior of its own, elected for a limited period. In fact, there is no form of organization or government of which they do not give us an example, and carried on successfully, showing a practical ability in this field of action, which no one can call in question. Then there is no kind of labor, literary, scientific, mechanical, as well as charitable, in which they may not engage, according to their abilities and strength. Who shall enumerate the different kinds of literary institutions, schools and academies, under their direction, and confessedly superior in their kind? Who shall count the hospitals, the orphanages, the reformatories, the insane asylums, and other similar institutions, where they have proved their capacity to be above that of men? All roads are open to women's energies and capacities in the church, and she knows and is conscious of this freedom. And what is more, she is equally aware that whatever she has ability to do, will receive from the church encouragement, sanction, and that honor which is due to her labor her devotion, and her genius. Few great undertakings in the church have been conceived and carried on to success without the cooperation, in some shape, of women. The great majority of her saints are of their sex, and they are honored and placed on her altars equally with men. It is not an unheard of event that women, by their scientific and literary attainments, have won from Catholic universities the title of doctor. St. Teresa is represented as an authorized teacher, with a pen in hand, and with a doctor's cap. It would carry us altogether too far beyond the limits of this preface, to show how largely the writings of women in the church have contributed to the body and perfection of the science of theology. In this respect also, our saint was distinguished. Her spiritual dialogues and her treatise on purgatory have been recognized by those competent to judge in such matters, as masterpieces in spiritual literature. St. Francis of Sales, that great master in spiritual life, in whose city we have the consolation of writing this preface, was accustomed to read the latter twice a year. Frederick Schlegel, who was the first to translate St. Catherine's dialogues into German, regarded them as seldom if ever equaled in beauty and style, and such has been the effect of the example of Christian perfection in our saint that even the American Tract Society could not resist its attraction, and published a short sketch of her life among its tracts, with the title of her name by marriage, Catherine Adorno. It was fitting that the life of St. Catherine of Genoa should be translated for the first time into English, by one who is now no more, but who was, while living, distinguished like our saint, for her intellectual gifts, for her charity toward the poor and abandoned, and in consecrating her pen to the cause and glory of God's church. L.T. Hecker, Annecy, October 7th, 1873. End of the Introduction Life and Doctrine of St. Catherine of Genoa Chapters 1 and 2 Chapter 1 Catherine was born at Genoa in the year 1447. Her parents... Jacobo Fieschi and Francesca di Negro, daughter of Sigismund, Marquis di Negro, were both of illustrious and noble birth. On account of his merits, her father, descendant of Robert, brother of Pope Innocent IV, who was uncle of another pontiff, Adrian V, was created viceroy of Naples, under King Regnier, 
in which office he remained until his death. Although of very noble parentage, and very delicate and beautiful in person, yet from her earliest years she despised the pride of birth and abhorred luxury, so that when only about eight years of age she was inspired with the desire to do penance, and beginning to dislike the soft indulgence of her bed, she laid herself down humbly to sleep on straw, with a block of hard wood under her head, in the place of pillows of down. She had in her chamber that image of our Lord, which is commonly called La Pieta, and whenever she entered there and raised her eyes to it, a violent pain seized her whole frame, and caused by her grief and love at the thought of what our Lord had suffered for love of us. She led a very simple life, seldom speaking with any one, very obedient to her parents, well skilled in the way of the divine precepts, and zealous in the practice of the virtues. At the age of twelve, God in his grace bestowed on her the gift of prayer, and a wonderful communion with our Lord, which enkindled within her a new flame of deep love, together with a lively sense of the sufferings he endured in his holy passion, with many other good inclinations for the things of God. At the age of thirteen, she was inspired with a desire for the religious life, and immediately communicated this inspiration to her spiritual father, who was also confessor to the devout convent of Our Lady of Grace, in which she desired to become a nun, together with her pious sister, Limbania. She earnestly begged the father to make known her holy desire to the superiors of the convent above mentioned, and urged that they would deign to receive her into their company. When this prudent spiritual father saw and heard such love for religion, in one of so tender and delicate age, he began to represent to her the austerities of religious life, the innumerable temptations of the enemy, the delicacy of her body, and many other things, to all of which Catherine answered with so much prudence and zeal, that the father was astonished, for her replies did not appear to him human, but supernatural and divine, and he therefore promised her that he would lay the matter before the superiors, which he did on the following day, at the same time communicating to them the prudent, remarkable answers of his spiritual daughter to his disclosures concerning the temptations and austerities of the religious life. After taking his proposal into deliberate consideration, the superiors of the convent replied that they were not accustomed to receive among them girls of so tender an age. To this the father made answer that judgment and devotion not only supplied the want of age, but were better than years. Still, they judged it inexpedient to receive her as it was contrary to their custom, which decision greatly afflicted the young girl, who still entrusted that Almighty God would not abandon her. At the age of sixteen she was married by her parents, to a young Genoese of noble family, named Giuliano Adorno, and although this step was contrary to her wishes, yet her great simplicity, submission, and reverence for her parents, gave her patience to endure it. But God, who in his goodness, would not leave his chosen one to place her affections on the world and the flesh, permitted a husband to be given her, entirely opposite of herself in his mode of life, who caused her so much suffering, that for ten years she could hardly support life, and by his imprudence she was at length reduced to poverty. The last five of these ten years she devoted to external affairs and feminine amusements, seeking solace for her hard life, as women are prone to do, in the diversions and vanities of the world, yet not to a sinful extent. And she did this because during the first five years she suffered inconsolably from sadness. This was constantly increased by the opposition of her husband's disposition to her own, which distressed her so much that one day, it was the vigil of St. Benedict, having gone into the church of that saint, in her grief she exclaimed, Pray to God for me, O St. Benedict, that for three months he may keep me sick in bed. This she said almost in desperation, not knowing what to do, so great was her distress of mind. For during the three months before her conversion, she was overwhelmed with mental suffering, and filled with deep disgust for all things belonging to the world. Wherefore, she shunned the society of every one. She was oppressed with a melancholy quite insupportable to herself, and took no interest in anything. 
but after these ten years she was called by god and converted in a marvellous manner as will appear hereafter chapter two the day following the feast of saint benedict catherine at the insistence of her sister who was a nun went to confession at the convent of the latter although she had no desire to do so but her sister said to her at least go to obtain the blessing of our confessor for he was indeed a holy man the moment she knelt before him she was wounded so forcibly with the love of god and received so clear a revelation of her misery and faults and of the goodness of God, that she had well nigh fallen to the ground. Overpowered by these emotions, and by her sense of the offenses she had committed against her dear Lord, she was so drawn away by her purified affections from the miseries of the world, that she became almost beside herself, and without ceasing, internally repented to herself, in the ardor of love. No more would, no more sin and at that moment if she had possessed a thousand worlds she would have thrown them all away through the ardent flame of burning love with which she was enkindled her good god by his grace impressed instantly upon that soul and infused into it all perfection purging it of all earthly affections illuminating it with a divine light by which she was enabled to perceive with her interior eye his goodness and in a word united her with himself and changed and transformed her entirely by the true union of a good will inflaming her wholly with his burning love the saint while in the presence of her confessor lost entirely all consciousness through this sweet wound of love so that she could not speak but her confessor was not yet aware of this when he chanced to be called out and left her so overwhelmed with grief and love that she said to him with great difficulty when he returned with your consent father i will leave my confession till another time and she did so returning home she was so on fire and wounded with the love which god had interiorly manifested to her together with the view of her miseries that as if beside herself she went into a private chamber and gave vent to her burning tears and sighs at that moment she was instructed interiorly in prayer but her lips could only utter oh love can it be that you have called me with so much love and revealed to me at one view what no tongue can describe for many days she could only utter herself in sighs and wonderfully deep they were and so great was her contrition for her offences against such infinite goodness that if she had not been miraculously supported her heart would have broken and she would have died but when our lord saw this soul still more interiorly inflamed with his love and filled with sorrow for her sins he appeared to her in spirit with the cross upon his shoulder dripping with blood which she saw was shed wholly for love and this vision so inflamed her heart that she was more than ever lost in love and grief this vision made such an impression upon her that she seemed always to see with her bodily eyes her bleeding love nailed to the cross very plainly too did she see all the offences she had committed against him and cried out continually o oh, love no more sin no more sin her hatred of herself became so great that filled with disgust she exclaimed o oh, love if it be necessary i am prepared to make a public confession of my sins after this she made a general confession with such contrition and compunction that her soul was at once cleansed of its sins for god had pardoned them all consuming them in the flames of love with which he had already wounded her heart yet to satisfy justice he led her through the way of satisfaction permitting that this contrition and self-knowledge should continue for nearly fourteen months and when she had made satisfaction relieved her of the sight of her sins so entirely that she never beheld again the least of them no more than if they had all been cast into the depths of the sea at that moment of her vocation when she was wounded at the feet of her confessor she seemed to be drawn to the feet of our lord jesus christ and in spirit beheld all the graces means and ways by which the lord in his pure love had brought her to conversion in this light she remained for more than a year relieving her conscience by means of contrition confession and satisfaction 
she felt herself drawn with St. John to rest on the bosom of her loving Lord, and there she discovered a sweeter way which contained in itself many secrets of the bounteous love which was consuming her, so that she was often beside herself. And in her intense eagerness, her hatred of self, and her deep contrition, she would lick the earth with her tongue, and so great was the wane of contrition, and the sweetness of love, that she knew not what she was doing. But she felt her heart lightened, occupied with unbounded, poignant grief, and sweet ardor of love. Thus she remained for three or more years, melted with love and grief, and with the deep and burning flames that were consuming her heart. Then she was drawn to the open wound in the sight of the crucified Lord, and there she was allowed to see the sacred heart of her Lord, burning with the same flames with which her own was enkindled. At the sight of this, her heart died within her, and her strength abandoned her. This impression remained for many years which were spent by her, in continual sighs and burning flames, so that her heart and soul were well nigh melted, and she was constrained to cry out, I have no longer either soul or heart, but my soul and my heart are those of my beloved. And in him she was wholly absorbed and transformed. Finally, her sweet and loving Lord drew her to himself, and bestowed upon her a caress, by the power of which she was entirely immersed in that sweet divinity, to which she abandoned herself exteriorly, so that she exclaimed, I live no longer, but Christ lives in me. She knew no longer whether her mere human acts were good or bad, but saw all things in God. Chapter 3 on the day of the festival of the Annunciation of the Glorious Virgin Mary, after her conversion, that is, after her loving wound, her Lord gave her the desire for Holy Communion, which she never lost during her whole life, and her love ordered it in such a way that communion was given to her without any care on her part, for she was, in a wonderful manner, provided with it in one way or another, and without asking, she was often summoned to receive it, by priests inspired by God to give it to her. On one occasion a holy religious said to her, You receive communion every day, how are you now satisfied? And she answered him simply, explaining her desires and feelings. In order to prove her, he said to her, Perhaps there may be something wrong in receiving communion so often, and then left her. In consequence of this, Catherine, for fear of doing wrong, abstained from communion, but with great pain, and the religious, finding that she thought more of doing wrong than of the consolation and satisfaction of communion, directed her to make daily communion, and she returned to her accustomed way. Once, when at the point of death, so ill that she was unable to take any sustenance, she said to her confessor, if you would give me, my Lord, three times only, I should be cured. It was done, and her health was immediately restored. Before receiving communion, she suffered severe pains about the heart, and said, My heart is not like that of others, for it only rejoices in the Lord, and therefore give him to me. It indeed seemed that otherwise she could not have lived, and if deprived of communion, her life would have consumed away in suffering. Of this there are many proofs, for if, on any day, she happened not to receive, she would pass it in almost insupportable pain, so that her attendants were filled with compassion for her, and believed it clearly, to be the will of God, that she should receive daily. One day, after communion, God gave her such consolation, that she lost her consciousness, and the priest could not give her the ablution until she had been restored to herself and she then exclaimed, O oh Lord, I do not desire to follow thee for these consolations, but only for pure love. Although she did not easily shed tears, she awoke one night weeping, when she had dreamed that she was not to receive on the next day. But if, for any human reason, she could not have received it, she would have been patient and confident, saying to her Lord, If thou wouldest, it could be given to me. She said that at the beginning of her conversion, when this desire of communion was first given to her, she sometimes envied the priests who received whenever they wished, without causing remarks from anyone, 
and it was her special desire to be able to say the three masses on christmas day so that she envied no one in this world but the priests and when she saw the sacrament in the hands of one of them at the altar she would say within herself take it take it quickly to your heart for it is the lord of the heart to receive it she would have gone miles and endured fatigues beyond human power to bear when she was at mass she was often so occupied interiorly with her lord that she did not hear a word but when the time came to receive communion she accused herself and would say oh my lord it seems to me that if i were dead i should come to life in order to receive thee and if any unconsecrated host were given to me that i should know it by the taste as one knows wine from water she said this because when consecrated it sent a certain ray of love into the very depths of her heart she also said that if she had seen the whole court of heaven arrayed in such a manner that there was no difference between god and the angels yet the love in her heart would have caused her to know god as the dog knows his master and much sooner and with less effort because love which is god himself instantly and directly finds its end and last repose at one time on receiving she perceived such an odor and such sweetness that she believed herself in paradise when suddenly she turned towards her lord and humbly said o oh lord perhaps thou dost draw me to thee by this fragrance i do not desire it i desire nothing but thee and thee holy thou knowest that from the beginning i have asked of thee the grace that i might never see visions nor receive external consolations for so clearly do i perceive thy goodness that i do not seem to walk by faith but by a true and heartfelt experience chapter four some time after her conversion on the day of the annunciation of our lady her love spoke within her saying that he wished her to keep the fast in his company in the desert and immediately she became unable to eat so that she was without food for the body until easter and with the exception of the three fast days on which she had the grace to be able to eat she took nothing during the whole of lent she afterwards ate as at other times without disgust and in this manner she passed twenty-three lents and as many advents during which time she took nothing but a tumbler full of water vinegar and pounded salt when she drank this mixture it seemed as if it were thrown upon a red-hot surface and that it was at once dried up in the great fire that was burning within her how wonderful for no one however healthy could bear a drink of this kind fasting but she described the sweetness that proceeded from her burning heart as so great that even this harsh beverage refreshed her this rejection of food at first gave her great trouble for not knowing the cause she suspected some deception but when she again and again forced herself to take food and her stomach rejected it all her family as well as herself regarded it as a prodigy for even when she attempted to eat in obedience to her confessor the result was the same this was the more remarkable because at other times she could eat and retain her food even up to the very day when lent and advent began during the seasons when she could not eat she practiced pious works more than at other times she slept better and felt stronger and more active and she also went to table with the others to avoid as far as possible all singularity and when forced herself to taste something in order to escape observation then she would say to herself oh if you knew what i feel within by this she meant the burning and pure love and union with god which those around her could hardly endure so much were they astonished that she could not eat but she paid no heed to them saying to herself if we regarded the operations of god we should look at the interior more than the exterior living without food is purely an operation of god without my will but it is nothing to boast of or to cause surprise for to him it is as nothing the pure light shows us that we should not regard the manifestations that god makes of himself for our necessities and his own glory but only the pure love with which his divine majesty performs his work in our behalf and the soul becoming these pure operations of a love 
which looks for no good that we can do, must needs love him purely, without regard to any particular grace, which she receives from him, but looking to him alone, for himself alone, who is worthy of being loved without measure, and with no reference either to soul or body. Chapter 5 During the first four years after she had received the sweet wound from her lord, she performed many penances, and mortified all her senses. She deprived her nature of all that it desired, and obliged it to take what it disliked. She wore haircloth, and ate no meat, nor fruit of any kind, whether fresh or dry. And being by nature courteous and affable, she did great violence to herself, by conversing as little as possible with her relatives, when they visited her, without any respect to herself or to them, and if any one was surprised by it, she took no notice. She practiced great austerity in sleeping, lying down on sharply pointed things. As soon as she determined to do anything, she never felt any temptation to the contrary. The fire within was so great, that she took no account of exterior things relating to the body, although she neglected no necessary work, and no temptations except those of her natural inclinations could affect her. This was the case throughout her whole after life. She so resisted her natural inclinations that they were completely destroyed. Temptations like insects could not approach the flames of pure love enkindled in her heart. Her eyes were always cast down. During the first four years of her conversion, she spent six hours daily in prayer, for such was the obedience of her body to the spirit, that it dared not rebel, although it suffered keenly. And she thus fulfilled in herself the words, Cor meum, et caro meo, exulta verant in deum vivum. During these first four years, the interior fire that was consuming her produced such extreme hunger, and so quickly did she digest her food, that she could have devoured iron. She comprehended that this desire for food was something supernatural. She was also unable to speak, except in so low a tone, as scarcely to be understood, so powerful was her interior feeling. Most of the time she appeared like one beside herself, for she neither spoke, nor heard, nor tasted, nor valued anything in the world, neither did she look at anything. Yet she lived in subjection to every one, and was always more inclined to do the will of others than her own. And it is remarkable, that although God even in the beginning made her perfect by infused grace, so that she was at once entirely purified in her affections, illuminated and peaceful in her intellect, and transformed in all things by his sweet love, yet it was the will of God that the divine justice should be observed in the mortification of all her senses, which, although they were already mortified, so far as regarded the consent to any natural inclinations, even the slightest. Yet the Lord allowed her to see what these were, and therefore she very carefully opposed them. She was sometimes asked, when practicing such mortification of all her senses, Why are you doing this? And she answered, I do not know, but I feel myself interiorly and irresistibly drawn to do so, and I believe that this is the will of God but it is not his will that I should have any object in it. And it seemed indeed to be the truth, for at the end of four years, all these mortifications ended, so that if she still wished to practice them, she could no longer do so. At that time, listening one day to a sermon in which the conversion of Mary Magdalene was narrated, she heard a voice in her heart saying, I understand. And by her correspondence with the preaching, she perceived her conversion to have been like that of Magdalene. Chapter 6 After the four years above mentioned, her mind became clear and free, and so filled with God, that nothing else ever entered into it. At Mass and instructions, her bodily senses were closed, but interiorly, in the divine light, she saw and heard many things, being wholly absorbed in secret delights, and it was not in her power to do otherwise. It is wonderful, with all this interior occupation, God did not allow her to depart from the usual order. Whenever it was needful, she returned to her accustomed mode of life, answered the questions put to her, and thus she gave no cause of complaint to anyone. 
she was sometimes so lost in the sense of divine love that she was obliged to hide herself for she was like one dead in order to escape such a condition she endeavoured to remain in the company of others and said to her lord i wish not o sweet love for that which proceeds from thee but for thyself alone she wished to love god without soul and without body and unsustained by them with a direct pure and sincere love but the more she shunned these consolations the more her lord bestowed them upon her sometimes she was found in a remote place prostrate on the earth her face covered with her hands so completely lost in the sweetness of divine love that she was insensible to the loudest cry at other times she would walk back and forth as if lost to herself and following the attraction of love sometimes when she had been thus lifeless for the space of six hours she would be aroused suddenly by the voices of persons calling her and attend to their smallest wants for she abandoned as hateful all right to self on these occasions she came forth from her retirement with a glowing countenance like a cherub ready to exclaim who will separate me from the love of god with all the other words of that glorious apostle her love once said to her interiorly my daughter observe these three rules namely never say i will or i will not never say mine but always ours never excuse yourself but always accuse yourself moreover he said to her when you repeat the hour father take always for your maxim fiat volens tua that is may his will be done in everything that may happen to you whether good or ill from the hail mary take the word jesus and may it be implanted in your heart and it will be a sweet guide and shield to you in all the necessities of life and from the rest of scripture always take for your support this word love with which you will go on your way direct pure light watchful quick enlightened without erring yet without a guide or help from any creature for love needs no support being sufficient to do all things without fear neither does love ever become weary for even martyrdom is sweet to it and finally this love will consume all the inclinations of the soul and the desires of the body for the things of this life chapter seven when the use of her senses and faculties were thus lost in her spiritual joy she said to her humanity are you satisfied with being thus fed and humanity answered yes and that she would sacrifice every enjoyment in this life for it what must have been the joys of the soul if even humanity so contrary to the spirit also took delight in peace and union with god this was the case from the beginning but at last that burning interior flame burst forth and caused a corresponding suffering in the body so that she was often obliged to press her hand upon her heart for relief she could not have endured these pains for two successive days and after their intensity had passed away her heart was left melted in a divine and wonderful sweetness god allowed her to remain for some days in this state and then permitted her to be assailed by another and still more violent attack so that humanity rather than take food would have suffered martyrdom therefore when she looked on the dead or heard offices and masses or even a passing bell she rejoiced as if she were going to behold that truth which she experienced in her heart and she would rather have died than live separated from those things in which she found her support and consolation she became reduced to such a condition that she had no rest but when she slept and then she felt herself freed from prison because her attention was not so continually riveted on god her desire for death remained for nearly two years and she was always asking for it saying o oh, cruel death why do you keep me so anxiously waiting for you this desire knew no why nor how and it continued until she began to make daily communion filled with this desire she addressed death as gentle death sweet gracious beautiful strong rich precious death and by every other name of honor and dignity that she could call to mind and then added 
I find, O death, but one fault in thee. Thou art too sparing of thyself to him who desires thee, and too ready for him who shuns thee. Yet I see that thou dost all things, according to the will of God, which is without fault. But our irregular appetites do not correspond, for if they did so, they would rest on the divine will, in peace and silence, as death itself does, and we should have no more choice than if we were already dead and buried. But she said, it really seemed, if there were any choice for her, that death was the thing to be chosen, because thus the soul is secure from ever offering any hindrance to pure love, and is liberated from the prison of this wretched body and of the world, which, with all their power, are continually engaging her, in every way, in their occupations, while she regards them as her enemies, to which she is outwardly subjected. When she was performing cruel penances, the sensitive nature never opposed her, but was entirely obedient. But when inflamed with love, it was wonderfully how rest of it became, and how much it suffered. And for this reason, because in penances the spirit corresponded to humanity, and strengthened her for her share in the work, but afterwards, the spirit being separated from visible things, and God operating in it without means, humanity was left in abandonment, and suffered intolerably without any help. Humanity is indeed capable of penance, but is not capable of such burning love. But everything was regulated by her merciful God, with the highest wisdom, which enabled the body to endure the most severe penance, and to live and rejoice in these agonizing flames, without complaining. And no one can know how severe is this suffering, unless he has himself experienced it. Chapter 8 In the beginning of her conversion, she devoted herself to good works, seeking for the poor throughout the city, under the guidance of the ladies of mercy, on whom devolved this charge, and who, according to the custom of the city, supplied her with money and provisions for the poor. She cleansed their houses from the most disgusting filth, and she would even put it in her mouth, in order to conquer the disgust it produced. She took home the garments of the poor, covered with dirt and vermin, and having cleansed them thoroughly, returned them to their owners. It was remarkable that nothing unclean was ever found upon herself. She also attended the sick with most devoted affection, speaking to them of their spiritual, as well as of their temporal affairs. She took charge of the great hospital of Genoa, where nothing escaped her watchful care, although her incessant occupations never diminished her affection for God, her sweet love. Neither did this love ever cause her to neglect her service in the hospital, which was regarded as a miracle by all who saw her. It is also remarkable that she never made the mistake of a single farthing, in the accounts of the large sums of money which she was obliged to keep, and, for her own little necessities, she made use of her own little income. There was once in the hospital a very pious woman of the third order of St. Francis, who was dying of a malignant fever. She was in agony for eight days and during that time Catherine often visited her, and would say to her, Call Jesus! Unable to articulate, she moved her lips so that it was conjectured that she tried to do so, and Catherine, when she saw her mouth so filled, as it were, with Jesus, could not restrain herself from kissing her, and in this way took the fever, and only narrowly escaped death. This, however, did not diminish her zeal in the service of the hospital, to which she returned immediately upon her recovery, and devoted herself to it with great care and diligence. Chapter 9 This servant of God had an almost incredible knowledge of herself. She was so purified and enlightened, so united with and transformed into God, her love, that what she said seemed to be uttered not by a human tongue, but rather by one angelic and divine which proves the truth that humble souls, thirsting after God, can often grasp what the mere human intellect can never attain or comprehend. She was accustomed to say, If it were possible for me to suffer as much as all the martyrs have suffered, and even hell itself, for the love of God, and in order to make satisfaction to him, 
it would be after all only a sort of injury to god in comparison with the love and goodness with which he has created and redeemed and in a special manner called me for man unassisted by god's grace is even worse than the devil because the devil is a spirit without a body while man without the grace of god is a devil incarnate man has a free will which according to the ordination of god is in no wise bound so that he can do all the evil that he wills to the devil this is impossible since he can act only by the divine permission and when man surrenders to him his evil will the devil employs it as the instrument of his temptation and hence she said i see that whatever is good in myself in any other creature or in the saints is truly from god if on the other hand i do anything evil it is i alone who do it nor can i charge the blame of it upon the devil or upon any other creature it is purely the work of my own will inclination pride selfishness sensuality and other evil dispositions without the help of god i should never do any good thing so sure am i of this that if all the angels of heaven were to tell me i have something good in me i should not believe them this holy soul knew in what true perfection consists and had moreover a knowledge of all imperfections there is nothing surprising in this for her interior eye was enlightened her affections purified and her heart wholly united to god her love in whom she saw things wonderful and hidden from human sense she said therefore so long as any one can speak of divine things enjoy and understand them remember and desire them he has not yet arrived in port yet there are ways and means to guide him thither but the creature can know nothing but what god gives him to know from day to day nor can he comprehend beyond this and at each instant remains satisfied with what he receives if the creature knew the height to which god is prepared to raise him in this life he would never rest but on the contrary would feel a certain craving a vehement desire to reach quickly that ultimate perfection and would think himself in hell until he had obtained it even at the beginning of her conversion this holy and devout soul inflamed with divine love was wont to exclaim o lord i desire thee wholly for in thy clear and strong light i see that the soul can never be at peace until she has attained her last perfection o oh, sweet lord if i believed that i should lose one spark of thee i could no longer live again she said it appeared to me as i noted from time to time that the love wherewith i loved my sweet love grew greater day by day and yet at each step i had thought it as perfect as it could be for love has this property that it can never perceive in itself the least defect but as my vision grew clearer i beheld in myself many imperfections which had i seen them in the beginning i should have esteemed nothing not even hell itself too great or painful that would have rid me of them in the beginning they were hidden from me for it was the purpose of god to accomplish his work by little and little in order to keep me humble and enable me to remain among my fellow creatures and finally seeing a completed work entirely beyond the creature i am compelled to say what before i could not say and confess how clear it is to me that all our works are even more imperfect than any creature can fully understand this holy creature was accustomed to use the words sweetness of god purity of god and other beautiful expressions of the same kind sometimes she uttered expressions like these i see without eyes hear without understanding feel without feeling and taste without tasting i know neither form nor measure for without seeing i yet behold an operation so divine that the words i first used perfection purity and the like seem to be now mere lies in the presence of the truth the sun which once looked so bright is now dark what was sweet is now bitter because sweetness and beauty are spoiled by contact with creatures nor can i any longer say my god my all everything is mine for all that is god's seems to be wholly mine neither in heaven nor on earth shall i ever again use such words 
for I am mute and lost in God. Nor can I call the saints blessed, nor the blessed holy, for I see that their sanctity and their beatitude is not theirs, but exists only in God. I see nothing good or blessed in any creature, if it be not wholly annihilated and absorbed in God, so that he alone may remain in the creature and the creature in him. This is the beatitude that the blessed might have, and yet they have it not, except in so far as they are dead to themselves and absorbed in God. They have it not in so far as they remain in themselves and can say, I am blessed. Words are wholly inadequate to express my meaning, and I reproach myself for using them. I would that every one could understand me, and I am sure that if I could breathe on creatures, the fire of love burning within me would inflame them all with divine desire. O oh, thing most marvelous, so great is my love for God, that beside it all love for the neighbor seems only hypocrisy. I can no longer condescend to creatures, or if I do so, it is only with pain, for to me the world seems only to live in vanity. Chapter 10. Vainglory could never enter her mind, for she had seen the truth, and distrusting herself, placed her whole confidence in God, saying always, O oh Lord, do with me what thou wilt. She had so little esteem of herself, that it was pleasing to her, to be reproved for any inclination she might have, nor did she ever excuse herself. So clear was the interior vision of that illuminated mind, and such deep things did she say concerning perfection, that she could hardly be understood except by the most profound intellects. Among other things she said, I would not wish to see one meritorious act attributed to myself, even if it were the means of ensuring my salvation, for I should be worse than a demon, to wish to rob God of his own. Yet it is needful that we ourselves act, for the divine grace neither vivifies, nor aids that which does not work itself, and grace will not save us without our cooperation. I repeat it, all works, without the help of grace, are dead, being produced by the creature only. But grace aids all works performed by those who are not in mortal sin, and makes them worthy of heaven. Not those which are ours solely, but those in which grace cooperates. So jealous was she for the glory of God, that she was wont to say, If I could find any good in any creature, which, however, is impossible, I would tear it from her, and restore it all to God. <laughs>